slightly different flavour, I think, actually. Um, yeah, it's based on my PhD fieldwork, as um, Paul has said. Um, and yeah, bringing precision medicine to low resource health systems, looking at this was based on an ethnography of um, essentially the process of diagnosis for Lassa fever in Sierra Leone. Um, over, yeah, we can talk a bit about kind of precision me medicine, what got me interested in it, some background on Lassa fever, um, how the diagnostics were developed, or for Lassa fever, then my kind of framework of trying to understand diagnostic processes in Sierra Leone. And then a little bit about uncertainty, um, and then some politics. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah. So it was this quote that actually kind of got me interested in in diagnostics. And so I think it's quite a well-known study. It's now over ten years old, I think. Yeah. So modified molecular technologies for affordable simple diagnosis of infectious diseases are the area of biotechnology predicted to bring the most improvement to low-income health systems in the next decade. So more than ten years old, but. Um, it was, it was these kind of um, predictions that kind of got me interested, and I think there was this new era of precision medicine um, that people would seem to be getting quite excited about, and I think for a long time diagnostics had been in global health and international, in, um, had been overlooked, and now there's this kind of excitement about what they might be able to do. And there was, beneath some of those kind of the excitement, the expectations about that, there was this idea that kind of precision medicine was going to replace symptomatic or intuitive medicine, um, presumptive treatment or uncertainty and ignorance almost. Like. So there was this idea that just there hadn't been diagnosis, technologies weren't available in these countries and just diagnostic diagnosis hadn't really happened. Um, so yeah, and the question about whether or not these diagnostics were actually going to revolutionise healthcare. So I wanted to look at how new diagnostics were actually being implemented in a low-income health system context. So, and it was really kind of thinking that this socio-cultural context was missing from some of the discussions about diagnosis. So, yeah. Um, so this is based on a case study of Lassa fever. Um, Lassa fever is an emerging zoonotic disease. The host species is a rodent called Mustelus natalensis. It's a viral hemorrhagic fever, um, similar to Ebola, which has now just completely hit this region as well. So, I mean, when I was doing this research, Latin was the big scary disease in the region, and now <laughs> that's kind of been eclipsed. Um, it's, it is like Ebola, a category A pathogen, um, which so it's kind of been defined, um, understood as having the potential to, for use as a bioweapon. Um, it's interesting in the sense that it's the only category A pathogen that is also a significant public health threat. So in parts of West Africa it's endemic. So that's Liberia, Sierra Leone, um, Nigeria and um, Guinea. <laughs> um, huge range, like it, it's essentially it's kind of was a few years ago your typical neglected disease. Um, since this kind of bio-defense, bio-weapon idea has come in, there's been a lot of money um, and it's now the kind of subject of, well, for a West African context, it's cutting edge <laughs> science. Um, and a lot of that has been about improvements in diagnostics. But these, the, the, the range of, um, you'll see that's a huge kind of, from 5,000 to 67,000 deaths a year is a huge kind of, there's lots of uncertainty about the actual burden of this disease. Um, part of that is to do with the lack of diagnostics. So because it was a biosafety level 4 category A pathogen, there were these diagnostics that were very hard to produce, very expensive, the bottlenecks, so there basically wasn't really any surveillance or diagnostics for it. Um, it looks increasingly like as they've improved the diagnostics, they're doing more and more testing, they're finding it in more and more places. Um, and so there's kind of there was a paper out asking whether it was an emerging disease or, or emerging diagnostics, and some of the kind of in 2011, there were these kind of epidemics in Nigeria, and questions were up being asked about whether this was epidemics of detection or the actual disease. Um, so there's a real kind of like un the lack of diagnostics has meant that there's a kind of very uncertain territory, um, and this disease is emerging in terms of also the knowledge about it. Um, this is a picture of the Lassa Fever Ward at Kenham Hospital. So in Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone is the only place. Um, that has treatment that you can have 
diagnostics and treatment for Lassa fever in Sierra Leone, but also Guinea and Liberia. Um, this is the ward. It's incredibly um, dilapidated and low resource. <laughs> um, just to give you an idea of that. Um, Yeah, so the, the, the big story I think with Lassa fever is that the, the, all the money that's come into it recently has come from these biodefense sources. So lots of US grants to develop diagnostic, their, their research proposals are actually diagnostics for biodefense and they've kind of focused on medical counter threats and countermeasures. So um, going from diagnostics, moving it to treatments and then eventually hopefully um, vaccines. It's all been kind of lab based. And what they've done is they've developed um, recombinant ELISAs and lateral flow, I didn't, my field work didn't actually include the lateral flow that hadn't been done then, so those are these rapid tests um, for antigen and, to detect antigen and IgM. Um, the scientists um, doing all of this, so a very kind of um, claim that they've made kind of great improvements in diagnostics and I'm, and I'm sure that's true, they so they're more specific but they also talk about overturning the dogma and the ignorance that Lassa fever had previously been defined just by clinical knowledge um, and now they were kind of having laboratory knowledge and that was kind of, um, that was what was going to revolutionise <laughs> um, treatment for Lassa fever. Um, and so this is just a quote from one of their papers, the current diagnostic paradigm for acute, acute Lassa fever should be reconsidered. Um, and a key claim was that the IgM status, um, that that shouldn't be considered as actually a diagnostic marker and that it didn't represent a positive case. So they would say quite kind of, you know, they're sick with something else, they're dying of, of something else. Um, and one of the researchers used to talk about how his favourite phrase was, throw everything out that you think you know about Lassa. So there really was this idea of like, we, we're, we're getting rid of the kind of dogma and the ignorance and the uncertainty. Um, this is just, yeah, to kind of show, it's all, it's all kind of Department of Defense, US AMRED, um, that's where, and that's one of the technicians reading some results. Um, but yeah, so as I said, I, I kind of think that, that those predictions were based on quite a reductionist and simplistic view of what diagnosis is. Um, and, and I think also the, the arguments about uncertainty, what I'm going to try and show later is that I think they, they didn't necessarily, it doesn't, improved diagnostics in this case didn't necessarily lead to decreased uncertainty. Um, so I, I kind of, you need to think of diagnosis as a multiple, as multiple decentralized processes rather than just an event that happens in the lab. There's a huge amount that goes on before and after that. Um, so kind of conceptualizing diagnosis as assemblages of people, places, tools, samples, classificatory design devices, um, numerous ones of those, regulations, networks, practices and procedures, infrastructure, um, and then kind of norms, institutions and perceptions. So it's a kind of a socio-technical view of diagnosis. Um, and that this also obviously varies, that all this stuff happens between, you know, village kind of level, across village, urban, clinical and laboratory settings. So there's, just really try and think about diagnosis as a much kind of broader um, process. Um, so in Sierra Leone, Lassa fever is diagnosed, as I said, at the um, Kenema Government Hospital, where this isolation ward is. Um, but the broader health system context in Sierra Leone is plural. Um, there's both traditional and biomedical, there's formal and informal, and they all kind of have blurred boundaries. Um, so the key point is that rather than establishing, rather than replacing ignorance or the lack of diagnosis, the new diagnostics are meeting with multiple, and, multiple other established regimes of knowledge and practice. Um, so it's not simply about kind of traditional versus biomedical but, or lab versus clinical, but there are these multiple classifications and they reflect different ways of understanding and managing the patient, the disease, its cause and the health system and the risks and the uncertainties that are involved. Um, so in addition to the detection of antibodies, antibodies and antigens, this includes in community settings like Mende, the local, um, the, the, the tribe, tribe of correct thing to say? <laughs> the, the, the population, the Mende population, um, their categories of ill, they had these kind of general categories of illness and sickness, so they had big fever, small fever, ordinary sick, and hospital sick. Um, 
and that they had very they had established ways of dealing with them, and that when and that when you would use Western medicine, when you would use traditional medicine, when you could use both, when you had to go to the hospital. So Lassa isn't even, but the problem is Lassa isn't really kind of recognisable um, at first, and so it has to kind of emerge from this context and the. To, and obviously a fever is in that context a very kind of normal thing to have. So the, the transition from when you can use these ordinary kind of um, treatments and then to when you have to kind of ramp up a level to something that's more serious, um, that transition isn't necessary. So basically the transition to ho a hospital and getting diagnosed properly or in biomedical terms isn't um, simple. So late referral is common for Lassa fever and some patients don't make it to the hospital at all. And this was often blamed on villagers' ignorance or med ignorance or kind of their preference for taking herbs in the village. Um, but actually, if you kind of looked at their di the, the part of interviewing ex-patients, um, money and the re and people's relationships were the things that really influenced how they were able to seek care. And if something could become a hospital sickness, so for, to be able to go to the hospital, you need money. You might need people to actually carry you in a hammock to the hospital. Um, and so there's not a rejection of Western medicine or pay or paying money for care, but, there's an amb but there was an ambivalence about government health care. So people preferred often to use kind of trusted, doc trusted kind of pharmacists or traditional healers or village kind of doctors, these informal doctors, or people that they believed kind of were, were more friendly and cared more for them. Um, there was also rumours of. Um, the, the kind of a government hospital that actually they gave you in fatal injections to kill you there. So there was this idea that that really if you had lassa fever you should be going anywhere except the <laughs> the, the hospital. And actually that's been replicated is with the Ebola outbreak recently. There's um, rumours that they're kind of harvesting organs and so people are kind of fleeing and going anywhere other than the, the hospital. Um, so in Clinical set and in, in, cl in clinical settings, there's also these kind of other other definition, other kind of classifications, and other kind of practices that um, people use to um, deal with Lassa fever. So there's this very strong sense of class of a classic Lassa, which was kind of red eyes, sore throat, high high fever. Um, and then there was also, um, and that kind of intersected with the case definitions, the formal case definitions of these kind of like checklists. But then some doctors or some health workers would add their own. Um, symptoms to this. There's lots of people spoke about something called black vomit, um, which I never quite kind of, it could be blood, it could be herbs, there's lots of things that it wasn't clear, but that was, some people included that as the, as part of the case definition for Lassa fever. Um, another thing to mention, yeah, is just, just these, these are, not to underestimate how incredibly resource poor this setting is, one of the key parts of the case definition that the WHO distributed everywhere was a temperature reading, so you'd have to have a fever over a certain degrees, but most health workers, most health, most health posts didn't have a thermometer, and even the Lassa ward didn't have a thermometer for a lot of the time that I was there. Um, so overall, there's lots of kind of variation in terms of when and how and if patients get to a facility, and that's mediated by money relationships and perceptions of the health system. and, and it, Critically, it doesn't all lead to the Lassa ward. In the village that I was doing my research, five of the six known Lassa cases were treated in private pharmacists, um, and two of them didn't go to the Lassa ward at all. Um, so they might not have been Lassa, but they defined themselves as having had it. Um, but the variation... Yeah, the point is, diagnosis of Lassa fever involves a series of negotiations between people, pathogens, instruments, and contexts, and the impact... And the impact of improved diagnostics relates to that institution and socio-cultural context. Um, but the variation isn't just in this wider system and what happens before you get to the hospital, but it also happens once you do get to the hospital, once you've had your laboratory test. And there I think there were some interesting things about whether or not the tests were actually... Oh, God. Um, <laughs> um, reducing uncertainty. Um, and so, okay, the new, lab, the new kind of laboratory paradigm insisted that IgM was not an acute case, um, and the antigen and the antigen positives would be an acute, were an acute case. But as tests were more readily available, there was an increasing numbers of people were tested. You find that classical cases, um, classic people with classic signs were negative, and people with mild and asymptomatic or non-classic symptoms were positive, and that was that happened for both antigen and IgM. 
Um, so it wasn't just that classical symptoms were being proved, clinical symptoms were being proved wrong and kind of unreliable, but also that the laboratory results were not always help, helpful for interpreting clinical cases. Um, and there weren't really any kind of clear rules for dealing with what happened when you got these, you know, clashes of classification. Um, and that actually, so in, in respect of the IGN, the clinical signs were becoming more and more important because the, the doctors were kind of having to... Well, yeah, it, <laughs> they were just like, whether or not the patient looked ill or stable or strong became much more kind of... Um, it, it used to be a clear positive and it was no longer a clear positive. Um, there was also some this thing about characterising the positives, that's essentially that with such a rare disease like Lassa fever, there's not, to be able to get the kind of distributions, um, to be able to plot the distribution curves of what your negative and positive samples look like, actually you probably don't have enough positive samples to really know what that curve looks like. So therefore, your, the value of your positive tests lacks some kind of meaning in a way. And so there was one, um, one of the clinicians would say, just because it isn't negative, it doesn't mean it's positive. Um, and then the other big, another thing, 67% of the samples for Lassa fever wouldn't... So, so that's, yeah, sorry, that's the, um, actually, oh God, um, <laughs> the, um, the very kind of essence of that there was some, lots of questions remaining about what the tests actually meant. 60 percent 70% of the samples were not actually Lassa fever, so then there was a question of, well, if they're not what we thought they always were, because that was already mentioned, excluded malaria and other kind of common diseases, what, what are these things? And actually... Now there's Ebola in the region, so it's clear that that's probably that was one of them. And they've just re-analyzed some samples, and they found evidence of Ebola in the old ones. Um, laboratory tests are not conclusive, so that was a point about um, that for local communities, <laughs> for local communities, that there's other things that can be behind the sickness, and so that can be like sorcery and unnatural causes. And while that I'm not that's not irrelevant, especially if you look at what's happening now with the Ebola stuff. So how how trusted the tests are, how trusted the medical teams are, um, that's all incredibly important to actually this broader diagnostic system. If you've got with Ebola 60 odd patients, the Ministry of someone at the Ministry of Health said, running from breaking out of hospitals or avoiding going to the hospitals, then that's hugely important for your kind of how effective your diagnostic system is and your disease control. I'll stop there. Great, thanks very much. <laughs> Excellent. Right, well now